So I will now introduce our third speaker of the day. Um, after this little break, I hope that uh, you enjoyed uh, Motoko Ishibashi's performance. Uh, there will be a second iteration of the performance um, this afternoon. Um, so our third speaker is Ingrid Lukegad. Ingrid Lukegad is an art critic based in Paris. She's an editor for Les Inocuptibles, Spike Art Magazine, and a correspondent for Flash Art, among others. She writes about how artists give form to techno-political shifts in individual and collective subjectivity. As a PhD candidate at Universi Université paris en porton sorbonne and Paris 8 Vincennes saint denis her research centers on artistic autonomy strategies during the 2010 decade. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you so much, uh, Clementine, for your introduction. Thank you to Bettina for having me here. And thank you all uh, to be here present today. So uh, my topic will um, go back a bit um, further uh, in time. Uh, I'm going to have a bit of a wider historical frame, um, but that is to speak about the present. I'm trying to go back really to nowadays, but not through a chronological reading. Um, and especially not through a te teleological one, but rather by identifying several moments in time um, where a figure of the artist relating to a certain totality, to a certain moment of change out of chaos can emerge. So the title of my introduction is called, and that is the wordplay, uh, Majerus Mimesis Miming. Um, but actually I wanted to speak about, uh, first of all, the perils of having a true uh, historical um, approach of newness, and then second, to see uh, maybe how some recursive strategies have occurred over time. So I will start um, very chrono chronologically with um, this very first approach of um, how contemporaries have approached Michel Majerus self-professed newness. Um, as the newness has been a characteristic often taken up by commentators at the time of Majerus uh, life. A telling example uh, is a 1997 portrait by Daniel Birnbaum in Fries magazine titled The Power of Now. This was only one year after the breakthrough show at the 1996 at Kunsthalle Basel. Um, so it was also an, arti an article that was uh, to become time giving. The first sentence is starting uh, and setting the tone. For Michel Majerus, art history is over. All images that have ever existed appear to be represented in his work simultaneously on an infinitely rich and hospitable present. Another entry point uh, would be the notes of the artist himself that um, have been compiled uh, through his sketchbook in the publication um, Notizen by uh, Brigitte Franzen. And relating to nowness, one finds several entries. The first would be, what is it about these times that makes them so representative in 1995? Or all paintings that have been painted anew. When I say all paintings, then I mean all those paintings we know and we no longer want to see because they've had their day. You can't drink milk all the time, it turns sour sometime too. And this was also in 1995. One recurrent expression of uh, Michel Majerus, as we have already seen in the previous conference, is referring to his forebears as dead suckers. But with Majerus' own work, newness also bears this very same peril, that of turning into history. In her essay for the same catalogue about the notes, uh, Brigitte Franzen brings up this very point. What looks like nothing but pure banality screamed out loud acquired a historical dimension over the years. Suddenly the painting of Michel Majerus fell into line historically. They are no longer that dynamic and loud, no longer that fleeting and superficial, no longer as obvious as before. And then of course there is the title of this symposium, um, which is taken from the 2000 painting, what looks good today might not look good tomorrow. Regarding to this topic of history, a third point to keep in mind would be a very generational reading. 
it is also one which bears the same perils of a symptomatic reading. This approach is the one that would emerge later in the turn of the millennium and also posthumously. To Peter Bakesh, a critic, um, reminiscing about his first encounter with the work in 1994 through the exhibition at uh, Neugier im Schneider Gallery in Berlin, um, he would write about Michel Majerus as the sharp-eyed painter of the cyber generation. Günther holler schuster in the same catalogue of the installation from Michel Majerus, would similarly also uh, declare Tron dead so as to encompass the death of Michel Majerus. He was writing about his paintings. He must have had the notion of a virtual structure in his head. And in 2006, the same Daniel Birnbaum, uh, writing posthumously again in Art Forum, also chose to embrace this later reading. The cybernetic reception at the turn of the 2000s had then become the dominant one, and in the article Search Engine, he was writing, to an eye not trained in the visual logic of computer games, the space can make little sense. But is it then possible today, with our eyes and minds now trained to encompass this cybernetic logic, to experience the same overwhelming disorientation when faced with the works? Or are the works, on the contrary, condemned to maybe have another reception, which would be to help us understand how, at the time, the senses of the painter and the onlookers were configured? Is the work then condemned to bear witness to a certain historical configuration of the senses? Or can we try to understand differently the meaning of Michel Majerus' works in history? There is, sorry. There is, however, another way to approach Michel Majerus' legacy. This reading is the one um, that I wanted to refer to with the title and with the two terms, mimetic and mimetic. So this mimetic quality would be then to understand a certain way of relating to totality, or more precisely to a certain totality, one that is time-specific but recaptures at a wider strategy and potentially also recurring in time. This alternative strand is already present in the early readings of Majerus, but is only mentioned fleetingly. To come back to the same 1997 portrait, Daniel Birnbaum is also speaking of a will to encompass everything. This, however, is relating to the treatment of the painterly medium. Um, the will to encompass everything is then related to the size of the huge paintings and the fact that no image is no longer irrelevant or unworthy of attention. However, it can also be expanded beyond the medium, so as to encompass a relation of the artist to a given totality. Contrary to simply situating oneself inside art history, this would then be a more horizontal reading. It also has to do with a certain compulsion, which is a word that the artist would use time and time again in his notes. In the same note from April 95, he is writing, such an order is a preponderance of the compulsion coming from a specific prevailing order. The term is connotating an uncontrollable urge, an ir irrational obsession as well as a coercive force. One can also keep in mind another much analyzed snippet of the works, which uh, would be fuck the intention of the artist position on the 2000 skate ramp. The skate ramp shows from there on a way to uh, approach the strategy of mimetic exacerbation. This strategy or tactic is hinting at a wish to fully merge with a symbolic order so as to better expose its workings. It is a non-critical one without any value judgment, but at the peril of a paranoiac turnout. The specific phrase mimetic exacerbation appears not so long after the installation of the skate ramp um, in 2000. It was developed in a 2003 article by Hal Foster titled Dada Mime and published by the journal October. The critic Hal Foster then looks back at the Dadaist artist working at the turn of the 1920 decade. In response to another paradigmatic moment of accelerated change and the humanizing chaos. What interests him in this article is a specific figure of the artist. Drawing from the example of Hugo Ball's performance at Cabaret Voltaire in 
Zurich, here on the first image. He characterizes the position of the artist as exorcist as possessed at the same time. A key persona of Dada is a traumatic mime, using the strategy of mimetic adaptation, whereby the Dadaist then assumes the dire straits of his time, namely the armoring of the military body, the fragmenting of the military worker, and the commodifying of the capitalist subject, and then goes on to inflate them th through hyperbole or hypertrophy. Accordingly, the Dadaist is not giving up on totality, but embracing it to the peril of their own persona and sanity. He is still so convinced of the unity of all beings, of the totality of all things, that he suffers from the dissonance to the point of self-disintegration. It is a dangerous game where there is no sublimation nor catharsis at the end of the process. It is also uncertain in its effects, as it's assuming a position of a critique that flaunts its own fragility. At the very end of the article, the poster is also suggesting a way to enlarge this position and maybe expand it to a post-war artist like Andy Warhol, uh, which would be a version of this figure refitted to consumer society. There are several clues in Michel Majorie's works that would corroborate this take. As early and as 1998, one of the two works installed for Manifesta II in Luxembourg already indicated that paranoia is a trait of fine arts. But to look like a detective for the small clues uh, in the work would be to miss the point. The idea is much rather that of a total chaos that demands to be left as such, left as a chaotic moment, left as a totality, um, and then maybe that would be best exemplified by the skate ramp, which we have already seen. The point of the skate ramp then is not so much to be a large painting, it is not so much the size, than the fact that it has a convex surface. To see the painting, one has to enter it, to be lost in it, and to walk over it or skate it. In short, this is already to subject oneself to a feeling of totality, of being engulfed in a hole, and this in turn produces, rather than only reproduces, represents or abstracts, a dizzying and dissentered totality. It is not a coincidence that this ramp would appear at the, in the later part of Michel Marjorie's production at the turn of the decade. In 2000, it was not only that the painter's own production has changed, deepened or expanded, but it was more fundamentally that the conditions of the time and the settings of the totality it was relating to had changed. The same year, in 2000 as well, uh, Michael Hart and Anthony Negri published their very influential essay, Empire. Empire was a theori theorization of a new world order which was breaching with the older imperialist modernism and now enveloping the globalized supranational world. The new order envelops the entire space of civilization, meaning that from now on, any response, involvement, or attempt to push against it can only occur from inside and against empire. In their recent uh, 2019 article published by New Left Review, um, they are commemorating the 20 years of his publication and writing. The fact that no nation state is able to fill the hegemonic role of the emerging global order is not a diagnosis of chaos and disorder, but rather it reveals the emergence of a new global power and structure, and indeed a new form of sovereignty. The legacy of Michel Majerus is also one that can be read with a timely conscience of having to work from the inside of a new scale and a new reality. Such a way of situating oneself horizontally in relation to the totality um, would then start with the Dadaist to echo Michel Majerus, but also encompass another iteration in time. Um, and namely the loose grouping of artists that um, were uh, growing up in the wake of the 2008 economic uh, crisis that dropped out of art school and that came together on the platform of the Web 2.0, um, trying to produce images from yet another moment of chaotic imagery 
and ever accelerated perceptual conditions, and ultimately also um, imploded when they've set foot in the institutional setting. So here as well, the notion of time is, of course, um, very present. Uh, this magazine, um, because that's the artist I wanted to take as a, a third comparison, were active from 2010 to 2016. Um, and here I wanted to look more especially at the nine Berlin Biennale curated by the collective um, and titled The Present in Drag, not only because there is the approach of time, but also because it's the point when the collective would explode and cease its activities. Um, the introduction to the catalog starts with, welcome to the post-contemporary. The future feels like the past, familiar, predictable, immutable, leaving the present with the uncertainties of the future. And then as a declaration of intent, let's give a body to the problem of the present where they occur, so as to make them a matter of agency and not of spectatorship. This other totality calls for a similar strategy. It is not so much that the visual material is comparable um, because the order has, um, since those decades, uh, become less and less legible. So where we used to have cybernetics and video game, we ha now have the seamless um, air-conditioned co-working spaces and the branding that has gotten way more effective. Um, but a first example to the parallel can be maybe the way of intervening in physical space. And so uh, from there, I want to come back to this image um, from the 1998 Manifesto 2 in Luxembourg. Uh, Michel Majorit chose to install one of his two works in this uh, cafeteria space at the Utipolis Cinema. Um, and actually there is um, a telegram to um, Ulrike Gross was responsible for the project um, where he is uh, explaining his choice uh, saying uh, they've got this huge popcorn bar there I think it's the only one in the whole cinema just where the bar starts on the left there is a concrete wall five meters wide this is just the wall from the work uh, the gym shoe and the colorways the environment itself with the coca-cola advertisements um, doesn't immediately signal the art quality of the painting, and that actually was also um, a reason of its very popular success at the time. Um, this, as well, initially started. Um, they are very practiced by uh, invest investing non-art spaces, and uh, here it is a view from the 2014 show um, they produced called This Own, Not For Everyone, uh, taking place uh, in spring of 2014. Um, and that was an art exhibition posing as a retail store, um, according to the press release, and which was set at uh, Red Bull Studios in New York. So it was a collective show um, with artists and collectives, uh, and just to name a few, Kay Hall, uh, Delphar, Dora Boudor, Simon Fujiwara, Lizzie Fitch and Ryan Tricartian, or Amalia Ullmann. Um, so here, instead of the gossip magazines such as Bravo or the Disney movie such as Tron, uh, we now had IKEA bags, um, IKEA laundry bags uh, with the DIS logo or with stock photography uh, collaged on it. Um, or we also had um, clothing items, uh, body pillows, doormat, hammocks, uh, or even flotation devices inside a total hell with logos everywhere. Um, but this to them was a, where, a way specifically of showing also the structural condition they were uh, working against in the sense that they wanted so the collective to produce um, aura without the hypocrisy since any museum as well was permeated by this um, very commercial logic. Um, at the Berlin Biennale, it's a bit of a different um, approach since this was already a Biennale, so already an institution space. And there were, uh, however, several examples of those um, environments. And to keep uh, in tone with the cafeteria space, I wanted to choose um, the juice bar from uh, Deborah Delmar Corp uh, called Mint and installed in 2016 um, at the Akademie der Künste for the uh, Berlin Biennale. 
Um, this also was mining the iconography of all the um, health-driven um, and very exploitative lifestyle, um, but it was also a function in Bath, so taking place inside um, uh, institutional space and selling green juice. Um, the uh, similar strategy of exposing certain structural workings by mimesis is at play um, because the name itself is an acronym of Mexico, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria and Turkey, which were the uh, fruit exporting markets at the time that of course didn't um, receive as um, much in return as um, the countries, the developed countries, which were branding and then selling um, the juices. Um, reportedly, uh, Majerus' uh, two works at Manifesta um, had a very uh, different reception between both. Um, the first one, the one with a uh, um, tennis shoe, was an instant success uh, with the art world. Um, the other one, however, was um, the more classical setup like this. Um, was uh, received as a relative disappointment and this one was the one which was set in the building of um, the uh, Manifesta itself. Um, but then for the um, Nine Berlin Biennale, the reception was very different. Um, yeah, I wanted to take um, this example of a much quoted article in The Guardian um, by Jason Farago, uh, titled Welcome to LOL House, How Berlin's Biennale Became a Slick Sarcastic Joke, and which is mentioning among the incriminating evidence uh, the juice bar we have just seen, or also the uh, selfie up work at the entrance of the KV um, building in Berlin. Um, what is very interesting is that this article is precisely um, leading its charge in the name of newness. Um, at the very least, uh, they write, uh, no one seems to have read an art history textbook. There is a century of precedence for artistic intercession into mass culture that undermine the fetishized newness parodied here. Um, the author then compares the Biennale to historical precedents uh, that to him, on the contrary, uh, had been very successful. Um, so he's naming Dada once again. Uh, or Marcel Duchamp, which had um, already turned himself into uh, a corporation with the Monte Carlo Bund uh, in uh, 1924. Um, but also, interestingly, a 90s collective called Art Club 2000, uh, who was staging mock fashion shows uh, with Gap uh, closing. So uh, something very interesting is happening here, uh, because what is it really that makes um, the strategy of uh, the Biennale and of this uh, magazine so different in its similar fusion with a consumerist totality? Um, what is it that makes its, its uh, reception um, so uh, opposite? What is it that has shifted so that one would uh, perceive uh, those strategies um, so differently as to write for them, art is hopelessly tainted by commerce and the past is for suckers? Um, what has happened between a playful dismissal of uh, dead suckers and uh, a past that can be only for suckers because uh, this magazine is not cultural enough to have opened a history textbook. Um, and again, the ambiguous uh, celebration of newness, which here is uh, read as a charge of not knowing what comes before, whereas in the 90s, and with Michel Majerus, was um, read and received as a painter of newness. This was, on the contrary, a way of knowing art history, but then repurposing it. Um, Michel Majerus' spatial intervention that we have seen, um, and that I will maybe speak a bit more uh, quicker about, also includes so this work, Beschleunigung, uh, at Munich Central Station. Uh, this is another one that was also interesting to me because it is in a, a hotel hall and a bit um, earlier. And then also um, the Social Palace that we have seen, um, but then also the television, uh, accidental television footage on uh, CNN. Um, so uh, throughout his life, those attempts um, at uh, bringing art into the public space, which were maybe less uh, attempts at bridging art and life, 
but maybe uh, rather of heading uh, towards an unprecedented fusion, were all very well received, uh, encouraged, and uh, even requested. Um, I am speaking about an unprecedented fusion because this is the, work, uh, the word that is used by uh, Tuz Martinez in her essay, The Complex Answer uh, for the Catalogue of the Ninth um, Berlin Biennale again. Um, and she is writing, it is known that we need to collapse the core premises of aesthetics, um, the distance that separate art from institutions, viewers, and the artists themselves. However, this implies a nearness or unprecedented fusion of substances having remained apart for so long that it could demand new organs. That is, a whole theory of relevance of senses in an epistemologist's term. So this, again, is further dismantling um, a chronological reading of new organs. Um, because by then, by 2016, we would have fully have the time to develop new organs since the 90s. So what separates both moments has then less to do with the relation to totality uh, rather to than to its institutions. Uh, with measures, the act of remixing content or translating it back to art history extends to institutions. Uh, because similar institutions are not fully dismissed um, as his interventions in public space or in commercial spaces are always framed by a certain context. And that would be Manifesta, for instance, or Open Art Munich. So they are enacted as a sidestep and intervening in parallel also between real shows. Um, however, with this magazine, it is another paradigm. Um, the conditions that they are responding to have hardened. Um, the face in institution is then at its lowest. And in the wake of the economic crash on, of 2008 and the post occupy Wall Street years, um, the dissimula has worked from the outside at first and seek autonomy from any artistic institution. So a last entry point would then concern an ultra-contemporary approach of totality, and that would be this time the mean. Uh, Majerus was um, aspiring to an art aimed lower but wider, but this was still aimed at art history because the faith in the present was still strong at his time. So uh, with uh, the Dadaist as well as Majerus, they were living in uh, moments of uh, tremendous change, but it was still a change and not a stasis. Even the Dadaist saw time changing not for the better, but still mutating and accelerating. So uh, there was still something that could be repurposed, um, whereas afterwards it became a moment of stillness. Uh, Majerus' production period was encapsulated, as we have already seen, between the birth of the Internet in 1996 and the advent of a globalized world order. But after him and after um, the 2016 Berlin Biennale, this would coincide with a moment um, that was to become riddled by crisis, debt and art for the 1%. Um, to go even further, this means that the recurrence of the mimetic exacerbation tactic uh, might have come to an end uh, in 2016 with the Berlin Biennale. Um, this also uh, was uh, more profoundly a way of highlighting a certain hypocrisy that then was going to come to its uh, fullest expression. Uh, in an art forum article, uh, Christopher Glasek, for instance, is writing, um, large corporations underwrite museums exhibition all the time. The difference with this uh, was that they highlighted um, here Red Bull's involvement instead of concealing it. And with the Biennale, uh, it was also a retrospective that was a performative ending uh, as a platform would close in the following month. So uh, if history uh, returns, then, as we know, first as fast, but uh, maybe then as a mean. And in uh, his 2019 book, uh, Can the Left Learn to Meme, uh, Mike Watson, who is a philosopher who has worked a lot of Adorno, um, is also diagnosing the lack of utopian vision of the very current uh, generation due to a collapse of the avant-garde stream of democratizing uh, creativity. But um, he uh, still has a hope in an attempt to match the madness of our media world 
either through interaction with its absurdity or by temporarily staving off a safe, unholy fabricated space within it. Except that in his approach, which is very still comparable to uh, Dadaism and uh, later iterations, um, the art world now has been uh, totally cut out of the equation. And this also means any artistic production that would try to uh, put back inside the museum, inside art history, um, the aesthetics of what is emerging online. For him, the trouble is um, that the art world has become inextricably linked with finance, uh, while remaining as culturally elitist as it always was. Um, so for him, uh, it is not that there can't be any freedom, uh, agency or creativity uh, within that very uh, same shared mediatic sphere of experience. Uh, it is not that there can't be any uh, user-friendly um, any user-friendly um, response to totality, but rather that um, any time that the aesthetic of online memes, uh, video games, of uh, do-it-yourself videos are put back um, into anything that resembles um, art history of art institutions, um, this only means uh, to reproduce uh, a capitalist mechanism where anything that uh, looks outside the system is then being cannibalized and uh, put back in. Um, so therefore, to uh, Mike Watson still, uh, art is today perhaps the most archaic metagenre in existence, and yeah, even when art appropriates uh, these aesthetics. Um, um, so I think to look back at Michel Majerus' uh, work in the uh, way that they relate to a certain totality and in the way of as they enact a certain strategy, um, it is also to uh, a way of uh, learning from his work accuracy. Uh, 20 years later, uh, it is very probable that the tactics that he was employing uh, would miss the point because the time has changed and he's not responding to those same uh, coordinates. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Michel Majerus was uh, not prescient and his work did not, um, by any higher consciousness, anticipate uh, the, re the recent or present techno-mediatic uh, condition. And I think that's maybe a big peril of wanting to uh, put back his work in a post-internet uh, genealogy. Um, but I think uh, to say uh, so, to say that he was responding very specifically uh, to his own conditions is also a tribute to the work's uh, accuracy and uh, to a certain perceiving body's uh, discernment. Uh, it is also a testimony to how an individual voice can emerge uh, in a playful interaction with a mesh of common denominators, mm -hmm. which are both at the same time uh, restricting a subject, but also a way for uh, him or her to uh, push back. And that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, so yeah, as you uh, in as you demonstrated, like first uh, through this <laughs> slide, and also. Uh, when you quoted this, uh, the statement from uh, the Dis uh, Berlin Biennale, um, it seems that uh, we're a bit uh, stuck in uh, in a moment, like in a we're experiencing exper experiencing a kind of st of stasis that has been like widely discussed, also by Mark Fisher, um, and um, as contrast to that, um, it seems that uh, Majerus was living in a time where of drastic change, but also of excitement and of um, of playfulness and of curiosity, maybe. And I, I, uh, I was wondering, and I was very interested in the way you contrasted the, the aesthetics uh, of the end of the 90s when Majerus was uh, active and his aesthetics. So using like Disney characters, um, um, comics, etc. Um, how you contrasted it with the very sleek aesthetics, for instance, of this. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a bit uh, more on these like aesthetic tendencies that uh, are 20 or 30 years apart. Um, yeah, well, I think the main point also that maybe I didn't get enough across was this <laughs> idea of paranoia. Uh, and that is also why I wanted to go back to Dadaism so that it wouldn't seem 
seem like history is progressing on a, on a one way line. So I think what is different, however, um, with now relating as opposed to the days and to uh, the 90s and even to the early 2010 is the fact that now we can't feel any change. And what I wanted to prove in their works is that even when there is a change and even when the speed is maybe um, going too quick um, for the human to take a step back and represent things, um, there, are, there is a certain figure of the artist who wants to show not so much um, how you represent it, but how you can make uh, the viewer feel uh, those settings and which is also a way of, um, I like this expression of new organs, but it's also a way of helping, I think, the viewer to grow new organs, not uh, through the artwork, because that is another sphere of experience, but also as a way to then become more conscious of what you are actually experiencing in your real life. And for me, it is a very critical strategy in a way of a political one to educate people uh, to be more in touch with their senses so that they can have a critical <laughs> reflection when they go out again after. Thanks. Uh, any question in the audience? No? Ah. I, I found that super interesting. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, in this Mark Fisher, um, just seeing Mark Fisher's name makes me think about his famous quote that it's um, easier to think of or, or imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I think that, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with the Disbiennial and thought a lot through it because um, it was so poorly received indeed in Berlin and um, they're actually quite positively received in New York. And I came to realize that the kind of aesthetic strategy of DIS and a lot of the artists surrounding DIS and that were in the Berlin Biennale was one of kind of thinking through the commodity object and thinking through alienation and using that as a strategy, a critical strategy. Um, and that echoes this idea from Mark Fisher of like, how do you actually like at this late stage in capitalism, how do you actually um, not necessarily work against it because that's just you know not going to work, but actually work through it. And I think that that was very, very badly received in Berlin because there is this really vibrant, important history of resisting capitalism, resisting gentrification. There's a vibrant street culture of protest um, you know, many, many buildings have been saved from demolition because of the squatting, uh, the squatters in various neighborhoods. And so I think it was interesting to see that kind of culture clash happening. And I'd never thought about that before in terms of uh, Majeros' work and where he exactly fits into that and his kind of approach to maybe a criticality in terms of how he's thinking through his relationship to capitalism and mass media. And I, I was wondering if you could just share some thoughts on that, like the context of Berlin um, and, and, you know, I don't even know if you know this, but like how he was received in that way um, in terms of like this kind of idea that Berliners have a very, very critical relationship to, um, you know, commodity culture and capitalism, and he was so so much embracing it. Well, from what I've seen in all the, because I looked a lot of the on the reception actually also for exactly because of what you are saying, because we haven't known him, so for me it was interesting to see the different periods of how that was changing, and also because it was a very few group of very important people writing about his work, so it was really a few articles that became so tone setting that ev everyone then was embracing it. But for me, actually being neither German nor American, weirdly, he was always passing as something else. When he was in the US, he was a German painter, and when he was in Berlin, he was, he was very Los Angeles. And I think it's also something in his notes, I don't have it at hand, but he's saying 
a bit the same that he wants to pretend that he's in Los Angeles when he's in Berlin. And yeah, he doesn't say the opposite, but that's a bit implied as well. Um, but then relating to Berlin and the this uh, Biennale, I think it's interesting, but for me it's purely because um, the city was a bit late in its development, but now it is exactly what is happening. And I see that I had a discussion with Mathis Altman, who is doing a show on that, especially now, about the commodification of, and that is even worse, on the alternative culture of Berlin and how that is being co-opted by startups very quickly, actually. So actually how this is even more perverse because like contrary to another city, you don't have this middle ground. So you don't have bourgeois culture, so it's from one to the other. Um, but yeah, with Majerus, for me, it was really interesting um, to see that this book, Empire, which I know have been influential for a lot of artists and that was also much more read than a theory book normally is. And they were a bit to me, um, maybe not the first, but the one who did it at that scale, uh, who showed that actually there is no outside. And, and they are interesting because they are very leftist thinkers, so you can't, there is not the same suspicion that you would have with accelerationists or you know, this whole other kind of thinkers. They were very uh, leftist in their thought. They wanted to oppose empire. But still, it was in 2000, and this gay Trump to me is a very clear example of this, that people also started to feel that they themselves didn't really know how to go outside from that or how to situate them. And so for, um, for militants and for artists alike, it also meant that if you didn't live in a kind of utopian world, but that would be totally detached and have no impact on the real world, you had to respond to this. And then again, the idea of paranoia, I think is very interesting as well. It means if you do that, you uh, are at risk of losing yourself. And that always happened, but it's where the strength is lying as well. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question? No. Okay, thank you so much, Ingrid. Um,